Welcome to the Providence College Podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you like what you hear, please review and share with others. Email podcast at providence.edu with questions or comments. Go Friars! Hello, and welcome to the Providence College Podcast. My name is Chris Judge, 2005 grad and producer of the PC Podcast. This week, we wanted to give you a slightly different episode. In April of 2014, Dr. Richard Grace and Professor Jane Lunan Perel celebrated their retirements by sharing their reflections over their long and storied careers at the college. In this episode, please enjoy Dr. Grace's thoughts over almost 60 years of being a part of the Providence College community. We will share Professor Perel's in a future episode. Thanks for listening, and go Friars! This talk shall be keyed to three words, thanks, remembrances, and hopes. I must tell you that this is not really a farewell talk. It is more like au revoir than adieu. I shall be teaching one course each semester in the honors program next year, so this is not the end of my song. Not the end of my song. In written evaluations of my courses over the years, one of the words most often used by students has been passion. That may be because I sometimes tend to serve up history on a fiery sword. But I suspect it is also because when I get intensely wrapped up in what I am describing or narrating or commenting on, my voice may crack or quiver. More often that happens when the sentiment is tender. So that's fair warning to you, uh, given the nature of this occasion. I have been considering how I might keep from becoming emotional. One option is to prepare for a speech as Andrew Johnson did. The only problem was that he was tipsy when he gave his inaugural address. (laughs) When he gave his inaugural address as vice president in 1865, Abraham Lincoln was appalled. Another option would be that of Jardin Matheson. They're the opium dealers whom I've been writing about for years. But their solution would have me standing here with glazed eyes and nothing whatsoever to say. (laughs) The third option comes from Kermit the Frog, who told one of his fellow Muppets that nervousness on stage could be overcome if he visualized the whole audience as sitting there in their underwear. I've settled on Kermit's solution. (laughs) You look good. (laughs) And passion has sometimes been the driving factor when I have been promoting a cause that I believe in very strongly, even fiercely. I am glad for this occasion because I shall likely never have another chance to say to the college community what I am about to say. I know very well that I have been a pain in the neck to my closest friends. They have been tolerant. And to other members of the college, I know that at times I have been more than a minor annoyance. So, to those whom I have offended in one way or another, in what I have done and what I have failed to do, I am sorry. It's a good thing that I believe in a forgiving God, for I hope that those whom I may have hurt in one way or another may echo the forgiveness of that generous God. Okay, enough. I don't want to paint myself as Richard III (laughs) or Mephistopheles. And the gospel warns us against making a big show of penitence. Some of you have heard me say at various points over the years that I have three homes. The first is the White House with red shutters on Gardner's Neck Road. Madeline and I have raised our family. The second is St. Mary's Cathedral in Fall River, which has been my parish for life. 
I've been a member of the choir there for 60 years, and I met Madeline in that choir. The third home has been Providence College. And this is where I begin to say thanks. This college has graced Grace's life. Many of the best people I have ever known have entered my life on this campus. I have to say thanks to those of you who have been so warm and kind to me. I can't name you because I would run the risk of leaving out someone who belongs on the list. But you know who you are, and I hope that you know how much you mean to me. Lest these comments become maudlin, I need to say realistically that PC has not been the New Jerusalem. We have had our family feuds. Some of them have been loud and long, and some of them have been marked by what Cardinal O'Malley has called Irish Alzheimer's. We're getting everything but the grudges. I shall be eternally grateful to PC for giving me the opportunity to do what I love, five decades, teaching history and crossing the bridges that link history to other fields, thanks to DWC. I realize that different members of the faculty may not think of teaching as their primary concern, but it has been the heart of my vocation here. Long ago, I determined that I would rather be an effective teacher than a well-known writer and I have no regrets that I poured the bulk of my energy into preparing what I hope were good classes. I have to thank PC for its very substantial contributions to my pension fund. <laughs> and for that security, I'm not kidding. Uh, there's a lot of money in there by now. <laughs> Especially because when I began to receive TIA benefits. The, the contribution of the college was 14%. It got cut back to 10, something like 15 years ago. 14% over 49 years, and also a good, a good nest egg. I have to thank the college for the scholarships granted to Mary Ann, Benjamin, and Elizabeth, which cumulatively must have saved us at least a third of a million dollars. And I have to thank the college for the sabbaticals, which I have generally spent in Cambridge, England. Moreover, I need to thank all the good students I have had who have enriched my life beyond measure with their receptivity, their challenges, and their friendship. I know that it is perennially fashionable among college and university faculty to complain about their presidents and for students of every generation to complain about college food. Even though they never had the pleasure of sewer trout on Fridays or hockey pucks on Saturdays, such as I had. And for everyone, faculty, staff, and students to complain about parking. In my half century here, there was never a shortage of brickbats to throw at Haas, Peterson, Cunningham, Smith, and Shanley. I even threw some of them. But I must say that I'm enormously grateful to those Dominicans and the whole Dominican community here for the past half century for all that they have meant to me and to the, uh, to, meant to the college and to me. I'm particularly grateful to the current president, my former student, and our current provost, Dr. Lena, for all the kindness that they have shown to me and generosity and warmth and respect over the years. The litany of thanks cannot end without an acknowledgement of the staff of the college. Secretaries, librarians, technical staff, IT personnel, administrative officers, the whole gang who make this place work and make the lives of professors easier most of the time. Part two, remembrances. I normally illustrate my slide with my lectures with slides. I can't do that today because the slides are all in my head. Uh, for things that going back 30 or 40 years, I have to rely on my memory and paint word pictures for you. So let's assemble a collage, shall we? 
It will be only a few pictures, but they will be some of the many images that remain so vivid to me. This album, this little album, will contain seven word pictures. Photo number one. Many of my fondest memories come from the 17 years that I spent as director of the Honors Program. It was much smaller in those years, maybe 18 or 20 students in each class here. That meant that we could know one another quite well. And beyond the intimacy of the classes, there were the expeditions to Trinity Square, or the Boston Symphony, or the RISD Museum, observances of special occasions such as uh, Robert Burns' Night, uh, uh, graced with Mackay's Haggis, um, or Christmas celebrations with a mass and a party. Our accommodations were modest. Uh, in the bottom of Stephen Hall, uh, where, where the copy center is now. But we had some grand times there. I recall one Christmas when we decided that the theme of the dinner would be medieval. Terry Curran presided over the preparation of exotic recipes. It was best not to ask what was in them. <laughs> we had a troupe from the Providence Recorder Society come to provide music that would encourage medieval digestion. And the coup de résistance for the evening was a production of the play of Noah from one of the medieval mystery cycles. We made use of a little bandbox theater called the Friar's Cell in the space now allotted to the copy center. And we had a cardboard ark with the ship's name Cuddy's Ark ins <laughs> inscribed on the prow. We had original incidental music composed by Richard Brundage, which seemed to interpolate blow the man down regularly and artfully. <laughs> with an ensemble that included the Russo twins. Where are you? And had a New Yorker accented wristwatch wearing figure of God, otherwise known as Peter Comerford, <laughs> in a Dominican robe stashed up in the corner of the bleachers. And the person holding this extraordinary work of art together, the director was a senior named Shanley. Photo number two. I just lost it. Give me a chance to find out where I put... I've got too many pages up here, and there's, there's a secret to that. Um, but I won't tell, it, tell you about it now. But I have to find photo number two. That's not it. <laughs> Here it is. Photo number two. Same scene, different mood. The morning of December 13th, 1977. Dozen, dozen very solemn faculty gathered in the honors room because it was the closest retreat from the fire apparatus and the hoses outside of Aquinas Hall. Through the mid-morning hours, faculty drifted in because they could not think of someplace else to go. And we had a dreadful seminar with just one question, why? I remember it like a tableau of faculty who had to deal with the immediacy of the question of suffering. We were used to talking about that question around the Wilson table, but it normally was in a work of literature. Now it was just outside the door, and we weren't very good at addressing it. And we kept asking God to give us an answer, and he was silent that morning. Photo number three. Classroom of Aquinas One, a converted dining hall that served as one of the original homes of DWC classes. This must have been around May of 1978 or 79. Our DWC team was Rodney De La Santa, Father Fabe Cunningham, Father Tom Fallon, and me. 
I'm the only one still alive. We decided, I think it was my crazy idea, to dramatize our end of the semester review of first year DWC themes. To give some zing to the review, we took on the personalities of four figures from the Renaissance, Machiavelli, Luther, Don Quixote, and Michel de Montaigne. It didn't matter that three of the figures were historical and one was fictional, because the four persons were buddies in a hospital who had arrived at the conclusion that they were the celebra celebrities in question. We knew who we thought we were, and the students soon caught on. Having adopted the different personalities, we could discuss and argue and strut and parade in ways that were unthinkable in a normal lecture. Oh yes, we had softball gloves and a softball, uh, which we tossed around the room with some frequency and surprising accuracy. <laughs> it was not a humdrum end of the term review, and eventually it attracted spectators at the windows. <laughs> For them, it was better than a trip to the zoo. <laughs> we actually argued the big issues seriously most of the time, and the students stayed right with us, cheering, laughing, and occasionally even taking notes. <laughs> we never did that again, but for one class of DW students, well, actually, two performances in back-to-back -back hours, it was a review they weren't likely to forget. Photo number four. The anti-war movement of the late 60s and early 70s is one of the most memorable times for me because of the close association of students and faculty in a cause that was a very uh, a passionate cause for us. I recall vividly occasions like the march to a rally at the State House that was on the night of the moratorium day when the PC students and faculty teamed up with a similar group from Rick. The groups consolidated at the corner of Smith and River, and we marched in orderly files, linked arm in arm down Smith Street, chanting, all we are saying is give peace a chance. There must have been at least 500 of us, maybe more. Even the bars on Smith Street emptied out, and their patrons stood on the sidewalk in amazement. The particular photo I have involved, in mind involves the night of May 5th, 1970. Four students were killed at Kent State by Ohio National Guard troops during an anti-war rally on May 4. A student called me to let me know that the anti-war student organizers here at PC were planning to call a strike. Two nights later, there was an emergency meeting of the faculty senate in Aquinas Lounge. Outside the windows, there were students lining the building, several deep, to see how the faculty was responding. The Senate was sympathetic to the students and passed about 20 pieces of legislation, essentially closing down the academic life of the college for the remaining days of the term. I remember the tensions in that room with President Haas sitting near the podium and signing bills as they were passed to him by uh, President of the Senate, D'Annunzio. And I shall always remember the faces of the students pressed up against those floor-to-ceiling windows, waiting to see whether the faculty was with them or not. We were. Photo number five. Actually, the 1990s seemed to me a blur as I was engaged in running the history department as chair for six years, and I was determined that I should spend a lot of time with my children as they grew into teenagers. We spent a sabbatical in Cambridge, during 1993, and it was a magical time for us. Photo number five is not a picture of PC, but a picture of two guys from PC. I and Barbara and me. Spending our sabbaticals as visiting fellows at St. Edmunds College. In the Easter term at St. Edmunds, there is a very fancy dinner named in honor of the 15th Duke of Norfolk was one of the founders of the college. Indeed, he put up the money. Not all members of college get invited. As much of the dining room is, received for, is reserved for guests, when the invitations are sent out, the order of the day is, quote, scarlet plus decorations, close quote. 
That means tuxedo, academic gown, the scarlet hood of Cambridge dons, and decorations of any and all descriptions. Knighthoods, church awards, battle ribbons from encounters such as El Alamein or the Burma campaign. Dinner begins with sherry in the common room. And the first seating is by specified places. The wines are the best of the year at college, and there is plenty poured. The courses begin with starters, as they say in England, then a fish course, and next a meat course, followed by a recess to the common room for coffee while the tables are reset for dessert. Upon re-entering the dining hall, one finds that he or she is seated in a different location with different companions for the desserts and cheeses. And when the master rises to signal an end to the formal dinner, everyone proceeds back to the common room for chocolates with the college seal and port. Plenty of that, too. It's harder to get the chocolates than the port. Brian and I were fortunate to be invited to join the knights, bishops, senior fellows, big donors, and guests from other colleges. Things finished off between 11 and midnight. I did not have my car, as my next-door neighbor in Cherry Hinton insisted on driving us to St. Edmund's uh, because she knew that there would be a lot of wine consumed that night. Indeed, as we prepared to leave the main door, one of the major donors could be seen sleeping on a sofa in the common room. <laughs> And one of the highly respected fellows of the college was being poured into, her, into the passenger seat of her car by her protective husband. Brian and I began walking home. This is what I remember most. These two guys from PC walking down Castle Hill at midnight with our gowns thrown over the shoulders of our tuxedos it wasn't yet the season for any of the May balls, so we were the only two fellows in tuxedos on the empty street. Discounting a few years of age and allowing for a change of university town, we might have been Sebastian Flight and Charles Ryder stepped out of the pages of Brideshead Revisited. Past Magdalen College, across the bridge over the Cam, past the Tower of St. John's and down Sydney Street until we parted company at Christ College, we made our own little triumphal parade from the enchanted world of the Norfolk celebration back into the realm of ordinary life. For most of the night, we had been esteemed fellows from America, from America. But when we got to Market Square and the clocks were reading nearly midnight, we became two blokes from PC who had been transported briefly to that other world. Photo number six. The last two pictures of our collage are set back on familiar turf. Excuse me for one moment here. I'm working from two sets of papers, as you can see. And there's a trick here which I'll confess some other time. The last two pictures of our collage are set back on familiar turf. Number six is set on the lawn in front of the Ruane Center on that beautiful October afternoon when the new building, this new building, was to be dedicated. In terms of elevated academic occasions, I think that this was about as close as PC gets to the Norfolk celebration. A month earlier, Hugh Lena had called me aside after my first class of the semester to let me know that the college was going to name a room in the new building after me for my years as director of the honors program, along with rooms for the other four former directors of the honors program and a room honoring Mario D'Annunzio for his long service as director of DWC and as professor in DWC and honors. I was stunned and humbled by the news. I had never expected such an honor. I was simply hoping to escape this spring before the assassins arrived. <laughs> In the course of the dedication ceremonies which the eminent at which the eminent historian David McCullough was to deliver the main address, Father Shanley told the large assemblage about the dedication of the six seminar rooms. All of the other former directors of honors are now celebrating upon another shore. That left Mario and me. 
when the president called upon Mario and me to stand to be acknowledged by the crowd, the applause rang in my ears like the bells of St. Clement's and seemed to go on for a long time. I could only say thank you to the various corners of the assemblage because I had temporarily forgotten all the other words I know. Photo number seven. A month later, I couldn't afford to be speechless because I had a different job to do. I have a very nice office on the top floor of this building. In fact, if it were available, I would rent it for the next year. <laughs> I was glad to receive colleagues from other departments to have a look at my part of the little history enclave on the top floor. John Garrity, who was managing director of the Angel Blackfriars Theatre, was one of the first to visit. But he had a specific reason to stop by. Out of the blue, he asked if Madeline and I would like to do a scene in the theatre de theater department's fall production, which was to be Neil Simon's The Good Doctor, based on stories of Chekhov. You should be guessing that my first response was fright. <laughs> I knew that at least one of us was hallucinating. <laughs> I told John that I would have to be careful about how I might broach this invitation to Madeline as neither of us had acted since we were in high school. Two months later, we were in costume. <laughs> facing the blinding lights that make the audience entirely anonymous and playing an older couple sitting on a park bench in 19th century Russia, singing a duet about whether any happiness was still possible in life. Neil Simon told us to say that it was possible, and so that's what we sang. It was a giant risk on John's part, but the student actors took us into their troupe with great warmth, and we found one Sunday that our picture was in the arts section of the Providence Journal, with a caption saying that we were starring <laughs> in The Good Doctor. We must have rehearsed our parts in the theater about 25 times. We rehearsed them at home several thousand times. <laughs> our, our two cats eventually passed out. <laughs> Our entire theatrical careers amounted to six minutes times six performances. But we learned indeed that there is still time for happiness. The last word of this talk is hope. Are you wearing out? I'll be brief. I want to mention three hopes, two for PC and one for me. First, I hope that PC will always be a Catholic college in reality rather than simply in name. For that to happen, we all have to honor the commitment that each of us has made to the mission of the college. Catholics can't take it for granted. People of other faith traditions or even no faith tradition have to respect it and promote it. And the Dominicans have to sustain their original commitment to the college. All of that is easier said than done, but that is one of my hopes. Second, I hope that PC will remain a liberal arts college. If you haven't noticed, the liberal arts college is an endangered species these days, as many different areas of academic specialization and professional development are pulling against that traditional model all across the land. I hope that PC will have the courage as an institution to resist that trend. Third, I hope that I will still be around to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the college. When I started here as a student, Lincoln was president then, <laughs> I would never have thought the odds were strong that I would be around to see the fireworks in 2017. Now the anniversary is close, and I'm very hopeful of attending. Can you take one more short story? I have to find the other part of it here. I do seem inept, don't I? <laughs> Many years ago, it was probably 
1986, certainly before Madeline became the director of music at St. Mary's Cathedral. There was a major liturgy at the church. I cannot recall what the occasion was. Lizzie had not yet graced the family with her arrival, but Ben and Marianne were with us, way back in the right corner of the church. Ben was next to me, Marianne next to Madeline. He was about two and a half years old, and she was about five. The opening hymn was All Creatures of Our God and King. Many of you must know it. All creatures of our God and King. Each verse ends the series of hallelujahs. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. When the hymn was over, the church was very silent for a few seconds as the last hallelujah receded. And the silence made it possible for the people standing around us to hear the little voice next to me singing, E I E I O. <laughs> you see, he didn't think that song was over. And that brings me back to where I started this talk. Do you remember that old Sammy Fain Irving Cajal song? I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places. That song is not over. And God willing, neither is mine. <laughs>